Hi, I'm Jim Raymond, and this is the third of three lectures in which I illustrate what I have been teaching to judges and lawyers in some 30 countries around the world over the past few decades and illustrate how I go about teaching it. The first lecture was what makes good legal writing good. The second was the architecture of a judgment or a pleading, and this current lecture will be five easy steps for writing a judgment or a pleading. Here are the five steps. You don't have to follow them necessarily in this order, but you do have to perform each one of these tasks at some point or another. First, or at some point, you have to identify the issues. This is not necessarily an easy task. We know that if you give the same set of facts and laws to, to a group of judges, they're likely to come up with different issues or different expressions of the same issues, and those differences can have, be, have enormous consequences for the outcome of the, of the case. And we talk about those things in the seminar. The second thing is to arrange the issues in a sequence that makes sense. Sometimes the issues have a certain logical necessity about the sequence. For example, if you have a threshold issue, naturally you're going to try to treat, treat, uh, treat that one first. But sometimes the issues are logically independent and there are some sort of considerations uh, for arranging them in the most rhetorically effective manner. The third step is to write a beginning. If you listen to the first lecture, you may recognize this beginning from a judgment by the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. And we determined, I think, that there's nothing particularly bad about this writing. It's just the wrong information in the wrong place. We don't want a history of the tribunal at the beginning of a judgment. What we want is an indication of who did what to whom before anyone set foot in court. And so I suggested to that tribunal that it consider writing its judgments for beginning something like this. Eliezer Nita Gika has been charged with genocide, complicity in genocide, conspiracy to commit genocide, direct and public incitement to commit genocide and crimes against humanity. More specifically, he has been charged with participation in attacks on Tutsi civilians, participation in meetings that plan genocide, acts of incitement, murder, additional counts of rape and murder, mutilation and sexual violence to women. Now this beginning does what I think the beginning of every judgment and pleading should do. It indicates who did what to whom before anyone set foot in court. And furthermore, it foreshadows the structure of the judgment to follow. If the reader f discovers that this phrase will be the first heading, then it's going to be easy to guess that the next heading will be this and the se following headings will be, will be these. That's a very important quality, particularly in a judgment of this complexity. The second example I gave you reminds me of what Annie Prue said about some bad writing when she talked about a cub reporter in her uh, wonderful novel, The Shipping News. She said, it's like reading cement, and that's exactly what this is. So it's a problem of style, but it's also a problem of the wrong stuff in the wrong place. None of this information is relevant to any of the issues. It's all available to some, in some, somewhere else in the record, and omitting any of it would, is not likely to result in appealable error. So if you were to revise this, it would be an easy enough task. You just imagine that a friend or neighbor, someone who's not a lawyer, asks you what the case is about, and you won't answer in the sort of language we've just seen. You're more likely to say something like this. When Catherine Ellison Jones arrived at her job as a security guard on October 12, 2005, she used a key to open a pair of automatic steel gates and started to walk away. She did not know that the gates had been malfunctioning the night before. Instead of parting in opposite directions as they should have, one gate pulled the other off its tracks. It fell on Ms. Jones, crushing her to death. I don't have to tell you how and why that's better than the original. And to a beginning like that, you would add the issues, perhaps in bulleted form like this, whether the owner of the company should have known that the gates were malfunctioning, whether the owner was in control of the gates, and whether the accident was caused by design defects rather than the owner's negligence. Now, if we convert these issue statements into questions and use them as headings, we're going to produce a judgment or a pleading that's extremely user-friendly. Then you have to analyze each issue. We don't have time to go into detail about this, but I have already introduced you to the acronyms I invented, LOPFLOP and OPFLOP. LOPFLOP for, for judges, you put the losing party's position first and then you say the flaw in the losing party. Or OPFLOP, if you're writing as counsel, you put the opposing party's position first and then what's wrong with that position. And that way you're drafting the judgment for the judge. So there are more patterns of analysis than that. You know, of course, about questions of fact and questions of law. 
you may not have thought about questions of judicial discretion as a separate category. And each one of these various categories can be subdivided and we give you particular uh, techniques for analyzing these very specific kinds of questions. Finally, you have to write a conclusion. Uh, sometimes judges tell me that counsel has persuaded them, but they fail to indicate what remedy they want. And the conclusion, because it's one of the most important parts of a judgment or a pleading, it's one of the two places, that along with the beginning, that you know your reader will read. It's also an opportunity to do some other things, like recapitulate the, the analysis that precedes it or add some arguments of consequence, particularly useful when the case is controversial or complex or when when the law is unsettled. Principle seven then is write like a writer. Some of those writers might be journalists like Linda Greenhouse or Jeffrey Tubin or Jeffrey Rosen who write for the New York Times or the New Yorker magazine. They write in a way that any literate non-lawyer can understand it and they get it right. They don't dumb it down. They're great writers and well worth imitating. But there are other sorts of writers that you can imitate too, at least in part. There are techniques we can learn from, from novelists. But there's a big difference. Novelists create worlds with words and invite us to inhabit them. Judges and lawyers, however, create worlds with words and require us to inhabit them. So you are among the most powerful writers in the world. What you're actually doing is creating the moral universe in which the rest of us must live. Nothing could be more important and the quality of your writing is the stock and trade of your profession. That's why you want to become the best writer you can possibly be. If you'd like more information about what I teach you can take a look at my book, Writing for the Court, which is published by Carswell in Toronto. Or better yet, come to one of my seminars, either in New York or in New Orleans. For more information about these, consult my website. Or if you'd like to contact me directly, my email follows me wherever I am in the world. I hope you found some of these tips useful, and I hope to meet you soon.